Good morning and uh, welcome back to the seventh chat meeting. Um, I'll just repeat the uh, message that this is a public meeting. It's being uh, webcast and recorded. Bill? Okay, I wanted to um, talk about um, the schedule for the rest of our um, existence as, as a chap. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here we are, uh, February 17th, CHAP 8, coming to a conclusion. Um, and we're getting down to the point where we're putting together the, the report, and I think we're making great progress. Um, my thought was that, and we had tentatively said we were going to have uh, something for the external reviewers by March 1st. I think that's now not uh, realistic, uh, particularly given uh, the fact that Byrne is not able to be with us. Um, so I, my, my thought was uh, if, if we gave ourselves as a committee uh, another month to do the revisions, to do the additional writing assignments, uh, does that, is that sufficient first? Um, and, and then um, if we got those documents together, the revisions and the additional writings, uh, we could share those by email or we could, if necessary, have another chap discuss issues but the idea would be then to have a report ready for the external reviewers by April 15th. And then they would have uh, a month to do their review and return it to us by, by May 15th. And the idea would be for us and again, this would be, I think, by email to respond to those, uh, to reviewers' comments. I think we could do this by email. And if we all did that by track changes to, to Mike, we should be able to, to finalize the document. And again, if, if there were issues that were so um, important that we needed to meet as a group, I guess we could do that. But the, the goal would be then to have a report to see a CPSC by June 15th. This, this sounds very sensible to me and I, I think, uh, I, I would say personally I can work to that. Can we be explicit, uh, the, the deadline, the original one for getting um, the material to the peer reviewers was 1st of March, so yes. you're suggesting to put this back to 1st of April? Uh, back. Uh, April 15th. April 15th? Yes. Yeah. April 15th to send out, to get it ready for the reviewers. To, yeah, fine. Yep. Lovely. Thank you. That also takes that out beyond the SOT meeting, so that doesn't uh, interfere with their review, because I know some of them are going to that meeting. And, So you're saying that we wouldn't get together again unless need be, and that would be May. Well, we could get together before we send out the report to the reviewers if it was felt necessary. Do you think at this point, given where we are today, that we would need another chat meeting before we, f we send out the report to the reviewers? I don't feel that we would need that. I agree with you, Phil. I think we can do it by email. Yeah, that's my sense. Very much more efficient use of our Then time. we can reserve judgment. We may need need another one after. After, yes. I would be much more inclined yeah. in, in that To respond direction. to the reviewers. Yeah, yes. because we may get some real interesting yes. comments. And, yeah. and we don't know. to debate them. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with that plan. Okay. See what happens. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll send out a, an email with that schedule then to you. All. Okay. So 
So what, well, let's, can we just capture that a little bit okay. if we have it to the peer review? Okay, March 17th, then uh, revisions uh, and all writing assignments would be uh, due to you. That would, that would be March 17th. 17th, okay, and then the peer and then, review. And then those would be distributed to everyone. And then a, a final, uh, I guess a penultimate yeah. draft would be put together and um, circulated among us. We do final edits and a, a report would go out to the reviewers April 15th. Okay. That would be back. Back May 15th. There's, there's the, the high school's protesting side. It's, they have honk, signs that say honk if you want peace. If you want, if you, if you don't, be silent. So May 15th, the report would go to the review or come back from the reviewers and then we would have a month to respond to the reviewers and put together the final report. Sounds good. And now that's going to require from me then a letter to you requesting I, I, an extension? I think, yeah. Um, that's what I'm told is, is a letter from the chairman um, asking for a, uh, uh, an extension. Okay. okay. Any questions or comments about the, the schedule? Hearing none, then let us proceed with uh, the recommendations for the phthalate substitutes. And Mike, are we going to have hard copies or are we just um, going to work from... The hard copies are coming shortly. Okay, so we'll yeah. start with okay. just reading from the screen. Okay. And the first one is TXIB. So again, these, we just have summary reports for these, correct? Right. Well, there there are toxicity reviews for all of the. Okay. Um, this one was prepared by us. The other five were prepared by Versar. Well, that is difficult. These studies are not published. There's no way to examine their quality. And there's this ominous sentence there, changes in epididymal and testicular sperm counts were reported by the authors but considered not to be adverse. And, and, what and the, does that mean? The, the, well, this is in one of those studies. It's in the category of we don't have the actual study. We have a, a summary. Yeah. And worse yet, it's high exposure. And, well, uh, I don't know if you're ready to scroll down yet, but TXIB was, we found it in a fair number of the toys that we tested. Um, it's not a, a plasticizer exactly. It's, a, uh, I think it's used to reduce the viscosity. Uh, but it's, it's present in a lot of things. It's, it's found a lot of products. It's found in indoor air. Um, um, so there, there are exposures other than from toys. So other than that, we really don't know anything about its potential toxicity. Well, let's look at this part. <laughs> So 
So this material is in a variety of locations for exposure, but we don't have enough data to talk about the weight of evidence or the true hazard of this compound. No, and, and you know, this statement, this is, this is a, you know, it's a draft. It, I don't think this is yet the chap's uh, wording. So what's written there under A, experimental design, seems to suggest that there are serious deficiencies in these Eastman studies, if I understand this correctly. What does GL mean, as reported in the GL? GL is guideline? Like GLP, I guess. Oh, yeah, the OECD. GL. That's guideline. Yeah. All right, so this is not a comment on the Eastman studies. It's a comment on guideline 421. Yeah, and actually, I think this is from, this might be from something Byrne wrote. No, I actually, yeah. could, it sounds like something he would yeah. have put in there. limited information on toxicity. We have limited information on exposure, both from the external side and we have no information from internal exposures. So we can't make a determination of anything at this point in time. Yeah. And as it says here that, um, you know, it's been found in, well, it says 50% of living, or, you know, living rooms and bedrooms. I'm not sure if that, oh, that, that's maybe dust particles. Yeah, dust particles. Uh, I know we found, we found it here and we were studying something else. I mean, TXIB was there in, in indoor air, I think it was. So, you know, there are other sources. I think it's used in paints or something, other kinds of products. Uh, and we did see it in a fair number of the, of the toys. Um, I think more, more than I expected. Remind me again the gestation days that are important. This says 21 to 23 days. Is that too late? <coughs> well spotted, that's too late, yeah. At this point, we just don't have any information. Well, it's too late for, or not the right period for anti-androgenic effect. It's mm -hmm. appropriate for other mm -hmm. developmental landmarks, mm -hmm. but not. And I'm not sure these were probably done a while back. Then you see from the chemical structure or the identity of the chemical, uh, we have to um, broaden our mind here. It's not necessarily that we expect anti-androgenic effects. That could be anything. Well, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's not a, it's, who knows, it's not a phthalate. Yeah. Are, are we supposed to say something? Are well, we? or say that, can't say something? Yeah, I don't think we can. But I really would like to complain. <laughs> I well, mean, I, okay, we're saying it's not a phthalate, we're saying it is a phthalate substitute. Um, in air dust, so we all exposed to it, and we don't know anything about it. We're going to find some more of that this morning too. So, but the point is, um, <laughs> I hate to just say, oh, we can't say anything about it. If we could, um, it's really frustrating let's, not let's to go have step, it. Let's go stepwise. Let's do the part C first, and then we can go on. So regarding risk, we could say unknown, unknown, unquantified. Uh, obviously, there is an exposure. Right. That's high. Well, we don't know and if it's high. We just know it's exposure. exposure. Is there? Well, but you not. Say it's in sixty percent of bedrooms. But it could well, be a little bit of stuff in sixty percent of bedrooms. Just and, like and, lids, little and bit. And we don't know what the 
endpoint, health endpoint to yeah. compare that to? Have to assume, uh, assume exposures. It's the incidence of exposure. Well, we know, we know the incidence is there. Prevalence, I'd say, yeah. is better. All right, we don't know the incidence, we just know the prevalence. Yeah. Prevalent, but we don't know whether it's high, whether it's low, whether it's transient, whether it's consistent. It's just like with the toxicology, we don't have enough information to make a judgment on either the hazard or the exposure to quantify a risk. We have neither model data nor, nor biomonitoring data nope. to quantify it. On that basis, what can we recommend? We can recommend nothing. We can't recommend anything. Maybe we should say that and then uh, add a uh, clause saying that uh, that does not mean an endorsement of this substance for use in toys. I don't know. What can we say? It says that we need to have tests done to before things like this happen. I mean, why the hell are we dealing with this after the fact again? You know, we've, we looked at, what, 15, 14 substances, some of which are banned, some of which are not banned, all of which have come to our attention because they were in products and we have to make a decision. The fact that there is no pre-product testing for exposure before you put this into, into commerce is to me negligence. And I don't know whose claim it is. Is it EPA, is it industry? I have no clue. But it is not the right way to go. I, I couldn't agree more. So, but what's open to us in terms of options? Can we, um, can we recommend testing or I don't know? Is it within our remit? Well, we had some we had some verbiage for some of the phthalates in terms of what. Thank um, you. You could put it very clearly. The chaps on the chap is unable to make a recommendation due exactly. to the lack of of um, published information or data on peer reviewed peer reviewed on exposure and hazard. Yes, but that, that's and then there'd be another sentence after that in terms of. And I think we had somewhere with one of the other phthalates. I think we had some verbiage that did follow that in terms of because, because if you just say chap is unable to come to any assessment then uh, you know some people might say thank God for that that's right no no but so, unable to because of the, the yeah. lack of the data and then you can yeah, go on and write the, another sentence yeah. or two well the sentence right, should be basically this is that this doesn't mean that there's an endorsement of this chemical we're saying that the appropriate organizations have to now conduct the toxicity and exposure assessments to ensure that this would be safe in children's toys. Before it's allowed into before, children's toys. Yeah, before, or either before or maintained, I don't know. I don't know if it is in children's I mean, one, toys. One concrete thing that the commission can do is, I mean, it's very simple. We can nominate it to the NTP for testing, but the first thing that they will ask is, if it's, is it a commercial product in, you know, if, is there a possibility that the manufacturer would do these testing? I mean, um, you know, they, they won't test something if they think that the, uh, there's a likelihood that the manufacturer will or but, but um, NTP should is, or something like NTP that. But NTP is only part of the issue because that deals with the hazard side. Yeah. We have no idea what the exposure issue is at this point. We know that there's prevalence. We don't know if that prevalence is at this level or at that level, and whether we are doing with de minimis exposures and then de minimis risk, or we're dealing with something that may have a quantifiable outcome. We basically may have an unintended consequence situation, or we may have a, you know, a no consequence situation. But we don't have the data to prove it one way or the other. Have any idea whether our previous recommendation might have an influence on future exposure levels for this substance? Might we, we have no idea. Are you asking, so based on our recommendations on the other chemicals, is this chemical going to be used in substitution? We don't know what the plan is, what it would substitute for. We don't even know because as Mike said, obviously it's not, it's primary use is not as a plasticizer, but as something like a gelating agent or? Well, I, I, they call it uh, some sort of a, an additive or modifier. I think 
Someone told me it's, it reduces the viscosity, in, especially in products where you need fine details. Mm -hmm. and, and I think possibly um, as they're going to different kinds of plasticizers, maybe they need this to make the other plasticizers work. And there might be some, you know, I, the manufacturer could probably tell us more about it, some of the, the technical people we, could, we can ask. Well, the point you just made is reasonable. It's just that we don't have enough information to decide how to proceed on this substance. It's not that I'm saying that substance is bad or not bad. It's just that without information, we don't know how to deal with it. Somebody want to start coming up with uh, some text for the risk? We, we did that, but we need to start putting it on the screen. Um. Something like uh, ex you have to assume, yeah, assume exposures. Or would you put it in words? I so think you do have um, exposure data. Is it true in general that children, that toddlers are exposed to chemicals that are in dust more oh. than other, because yeah. they're down in the floor playing around? We call them the rugrats. So the children are at the most risk of chemicals yeah. like this that are present in dust? In dust. I mean, I've proven, I've, I've done what? Multiple studies on that issue and demonstrated clearly that the rugrats are highest at risk to materials that are deposited in the rug. For two reasons. One, the rug is a great reservoir. It's a great reservoir for everything from peanut butter and jelly to is there, other is materials. There a, is there a uh, multiplier? Can you say it's twice as, the exposure is twice as high, ten it, times as high? It depends upon how long the material has been in there. Like if you have a material that's been there a long, long time, you can have very large quantities. And it's been a short period of time, small quantities. In other cases, you know, that's... Can you give a range? Roughly? It can be a factor of 2 to 20. You know, it's, it's, it just depends upon the chemical. Lead is our classic example where it can be astronomical because of the fact that it's in places where we find lead paint, you know, flaking off of walls and tracking in lead paint from yards and street dust, um, you clearly get a high concentration. So why do we let our children be the guinea pigs on this? I mean, this is outrageous to me company needs to hold, be responsible to show toxicity data for these chemicals. Well, and the EPA knows all about these dust, so where are they in this all this? I mean, it's, it's, it's a multitude of, of errors here. Um, this is the migration data that we have for uh, the plasticizers that we found in toys. Uh, I mean, this is TXIB. It's, it's generally present at lower levels than the other phthalates. But you can see the, the curve of, of uh, this is the plasticizer concentration down here in the migration rate. The, cur the curve is steeper, but it's, the migration rates are about the same because it's usually, uh, it's always present with another plasticizer. But we have data for TXIB, uh, ATBC, DINCH, and uh, DEHT, the, the terra phthalate. EHT is, a, is a, an isomer of DEHP. Now, can, uh, if, can you see that? Sorry, I'm slow. Mike, explain to me the migration. You're saying into saliva. Is that what that says? <coughs> well, this is, a, um, this is migration into simulated saliva using a test that was 
developed uh, by the European Commission. Oh, it's a simulation. It's, it's not a, a simulation, it's not, okay. but this is uh, used to estimate exposure from mouthing uh, toys, teethers and toys, that kind of thing. And so this is, this is DINP, and DINCH is very similar. Uh, these others are, are a little bit higher. But overall, um, but it's, of course, depends on concentration, and overall, the, I mean, the absolute magnitude of the migration is probably about the same for TXIB as the others uh, because it's not used alone. Um, but, you know, it shows that my um, exposure from mouthing does occur and that we can estimate the magnitude of that exposure. But what we don't, you know, but really in that case what's lacking is the, uh, the hazard information. And this is uh, just a pie chart. I mean, TXIB was present in, you know, say 15% of the things that we tested, just a sort of a grab sample. But this is what we have essentially on exposure for the substitutes. When was this done, Mike? This was done in 2010. Oh, we so actually got these samples uh, a month or two before the new regulations went into effect. We were going to do a for, before and after, but I mean, there was mm -hmm. only two phthalates that we saw, so we didn't ever follow it up. Mm -hmm. And of those two phthalates, one of them is actually allowed because it's it was a toy that can't fit in a, the DINP is in a big rubber ball and it can't fit in the kid's mouth. mouth. Yeah, which is fine, understandable. And the DEHP was some, I, uh, some kind of toy that, um, or some product that at, at the time, I guess in the past, it, it, it was outside the scope of the products that we were considering. Is there any way to get more information from Eastman Chemical about this 2001 study where they say that they observed epididymal? Yeah, and, well, I think it, it's the similar situation with uh, uh, Dinch is the, they have the data, they're willing to share it, but they don't want it to become public is, is my understanding. Uh, I think it's, it's um, essentially in the same boat as those other chemicals. And... You know, the chap talked about this at the early meetings in about transparency and so on, and it's, you know, it's a decision. So, you know, if you look at the FDA model of companies coming and showing data, I mean, that's yeah. all kept confidential. Yes. But at least there's a regulatory agency involved in reviewing the data. I mean, could, could a process like that be recommended by chap? Uh, maybe that's pie in the sky, but mm. to have more transparency between the regulator and the company, otherwise it's not a pr I mean, I know that's a big deal, but this is it's ridiculous hard. to let this just go on and on, well, especially with our children. I do think that the issue needs an airing with all parties involved to come up with a, I'd say, a logical plan of action so that one public doesn't feel it's at risk, two, the industry feels it's got a fair hearing to get things done, and three, we the scientists can sit and evaluate the data in such a way that we can come up with more concrete conclusions at times rather than being in the position we are today. This, this is a much broader issue than just what we're dealing with today. It's a very major issue. I realize issue. that. I realize that. But I'm, what I'm trying to say is... Uh, you know, it's, it's not acceptable to me for this to keep going on like this. Um, if, the, if the company's doing studies, we have no way of evaluating the quality of the studies. Um, but, and in my ranking, I would much prefer them having the opportunity to come talk to a regulating body than for us to have transparency. Right. And, well, I mean, obviously the model is different for things like drugs and um, 
drugs and pesticides. It's a very different model. In, in that case, the government can de demand a whole list of studies, and they have control over that, but the data are kept confidential. And that's one model. Um, I mean, the way we've always done it here is to have it all public, but obviously there are disadvantages to that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this, this proceeding is not a routine regulatory process like a, a pesticide registration or something like that. This kind of a process maybe does need to be much more transparent than like something like REACH registration or, or mm -hmm. you know, TSCA uh, notice. I mean, it's, it's a complicated issue. I, I think it is broader. Mm -hmm. It's a lot broader than the JAP in just CPSC. Um, and um, I don't know the answers or the best way to do, do this, but I think um, the, we have, a, the, I don't think th there's a, a, an overarching system. No. I mean, we have the different agencies and the different responsibilities. Well, I would propose that we write in as strong as language as possible in our report a recommendation for some sort of a change in process and, you know, lobby that to Congress because it's ridiculous that this keeps going on and on. Environmental chemicals are here to stay and we need to have regulatory, you know, re um, assessment of that. Um, yeah. I, I would suggest, I mean, I, th I think you're all agreeing that we go back and draft some text recommendation section. I just already did for the broader scope stuff from yesterday from, uh, you know, uncertainty and gaps and all this stuff is captured in it. I just more forcefully added a few more words to deal with Chris's comments. Because that I think we need, course, we need hypothetically something. Hypothetically, another way of doing this, but I don't know whether we're overstepping our mark, but uh, hypothetically we could say an interim ban until data uh, are provided. I, I don't think I would do it's that. It's a stimulus. It's an incentive. I don't think it would hold up. Hold up what? Nobody's going to be able to hold up. Sort of. I don't want to look foolish to make a point. But we're I only making make recommendations, though. Huh? Paul, we're only making recommendations. I mean, CPSC is the one that's going to make the decision to either go with that recommendation or not. But we have to have a reason to well, say we, we we're going to we're going to give it. I mean, <laughs> being unknown doesn't necessarily mean it's a reason. It's, it could be a reason. No, but that's not the reason. The reason is the lack of data and the fact that there has to be data before we can make a decision. And until that time, there has to be a ban. The problem is, though, we like our plastics. Yeah. You know, I, you know so I, I don't want to get rid of all, you know, I like the things I have that are plastic, but I also don't want my children exposed to this crap, and that's the bottom line. If it's bad stuff, get rid of it. You know, if it's good stuff, show us it's good. Um, right. But I don't want to end up in the courts with <laughs> somebody saying, well, it's good versus bad, and then the whole concept of what we want to have done is lost. Right? That, that's the problem I see. If we want a concept you, you, that's you addressed. You yourself pointed out that we're practically dealing with a situation where, to use this uh, analogy, where someone starts uh, flying an aeroplane, takes off, and the airport at the other end isn't built yet. So. You've got clever pilots. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I don't have any answer to this. It's from something that's, that's we've struggled with for years because Tosca doesn't cover this issue either. It covers raw chemicals and it's a, it's a conundrum. But looking at this data given here, we ha I think we have to be aware that the exposure, the relevant exposure for the children and the pregnant mothers might be higher to these substances than the the lights we investigated yesterday. But we don't know if it's in kids' toys. Obviously, it's there. Uh, no, it's in the dust. No, we, it's in, no, in, it's, the it's in toys. 
I know it's in the toys, but what? It probably what or I think the data does show it's there. I mean, if if you're not using A, B, and C, and now you're using X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. so choice. Now, now we have yesterday we said most of the phthalates are not relevant for toys. Now we have the case that these substances are obviously of relevance for toys. I don't know how to deal with this. Don't we not we don't have enough data to? The kind of thing we would. I, I, maybe it's too late in the game to even entertain this thought, but. Um, is this the kind of thing where we could request informa more information from Eastman um, to review? And if it's not up to our, you know, we, if we can't get enough information from that, then we would ban it? Well, I think In for, for practical reasons, I mean, I, I don't know. Some of these studies can be very voluminous. So at this time, depending on how many pages there are, it, it might be too late for that. Um, and it's the issue, I think, you know, it, it, we've had the same um, discussions with BASF, and they're willing to share the data as long as it's kept confidential. I mean, they're, they're open to, um, to something like that, and they have been, but, it's, uh, but it, wouldn't, it likely would not be public. The, the actual studies probably would not be public. Obviously, it is it is to do with a with a structural or systemic problem here in the legislation. And um, I mean, what I uh, what I floated hypothetically this idea of uh, of proposing an interim ban in these cases may indeed look out of place uh, in the sense that here the chap tail tries to. Uh, wiggle the entire big dog of, of that big problem. Yeah. It may may indeed look out of place, but yeah, I think it. May. I don't know. What do you think about that? I think if we make a strong statement about the need for research, bold, flashing lights, neon lights, I think it. I think it will get enough attention. That's yeah. Well, it will be without any consequence. Yeah, it just it kicks it down the road. We've said it, blah blah blah. I mean, that's but we what don't people know what hear. we're kicking down the road. That's the issue. Where are we kicking down the road? Something that is a serious problem or a non-problem? I mean, I don't want to be in a position where two years from now they, it becomes a non-problem problem, and then we've kicked something down the road which we shouldn't even have touched. Well, just I mean, Tosca reform I think has been on Congress's agenda for the last couple of Congresses. And you know it's it's a huge. Um, it would be a huge undertaking. Um, what about if we ask if Phil could go talk to Congress? <laughs> Thank you. No, I I think it's a bit. It, I'll it is a briefcase, <laughs> but it is a, a much bigger, much broader. I mean, the the scope of this chap is incredibly broad in. But to talk about these kinds of issues is 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 uh, much broader and much higher. You know, it, and clearly, when when Congress gave us this mandate, there was great concern about phthalates and, by extension, the the substitutes. They wanted us to look at everything, and yeah, okay. what is the the most effective way that we as a committee can transmit our concern, concerns, if we have any, to them? Is it by just saying that for this kind of a chemical that we have concerns because we can't interpret the significance of the limited data we have and we're very concerned about the fact that there's a lack of critical data that we need to make a uh, informed decision, and that's all we say. Or do we want to buttress that by saying, because of that, 
we feel we have to recommend an interim ban until those concerns are addressed. That's, that's, that's the I question could, we have to answer. I could relate to that. But that. And that puts the burden on the companies, which may be where it should be. But I think that I think what we're really seeing is the process is broken. It needs to be reformed. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's not just the company's problem. That's the whole. It's the system. Yeah, that's the system. Maybe it would look out of place if these were sort of small potato chemicals, but some of them are really high production volume things. It's not small potatoes. True. I don't know. I don't know which will get us more realistic attention. If we propose a ban the, and ignore the, lament, the ban, then it just goes on. The lament about the Tosca reform, et cetera, et cetera, feels a little like barking at the moon. I'm oh, not sure. I, I wouldn't want to put that in. About Tosca I'm reform. not suggesting to uh, to put that in, but but a lot of the comments that were made. I mean, I can't detect a political will here to reform Tosca at the moment, so it is a little feels like barking at the moon. Mm -hmm. So I. Philip's uh, way of looking at it, the only option open to us, um, if we take this responsibly, is to indeed say interim bans until data are available. Have the option of, uh, for some of these chemicals, not having the, the uh, transparency? Can we, can we? I mean, I mean it's up to the chap. Um, um, you discussed this at the uh, first couple of meetings, especially I think the second meeting way back. Yeah. And you know, it's it's really it's up to you. Seems to me we have a small window of opportunity that you know, with a, at least the threat of a ban, we might have an opportunity to communicate with the different manufacturers and um, what we see we're not happy with in terms of toxicity, then we'll know what, but if, if the chemical is in fact safe enough, I don't know how we can do this. I'm reluctant. I really am. Because I don't know what. I haven't got a plan of action beyond it. And I don't know what we're, what where the landmines are at all. Or even to consider a set of steps, next steps, if we recommend it. But the case, as put by Chris and by Phil, um, well, there is some the arguments carry some force. These are high production volume chemicals. So if you're uncomfortable with this, can you put some rational arguments on the table why you're uncomfortable? Or is it just a feeling? And just a feeling. I, I emotion. Emotion. Hmm. It's hard, it's hard to quantify. I mean, the point is, is that it's, there are so many other issues beyond this chap that one has to deal with in this particular case regulations of other agencies, there are other other regulatory bodies, there's the whole process of how one gets things to market, which are so confusing when you're dealing with consumer products that I don't really don't really feel that I have enough background but to Paul, make an intellectual decision at this point. But we're not tasked with that. Our, our charge is to make recommendations in terms of actions and bans, interim bans, and what goes on after our report's written and the processes and market forces and industry, et cetera, is not something we can control or something that's in our charge right. to consider. Yeah. Exactly. We're to consider exposure, hazard, risk. Exactly. Make a decision. And it I, seems to me the worst thing is if these products get into high volume, you know, continue in high volume production, 
and our children are at risk. I mean, that's, so if maybe. we have an opportunity well, maybe. to see what we're dealing with. Maybe. The but I think we should narrow here. down what, what our charge is, which is what we did yesterday. We went through, you know, exposure, hazard, risk, make a recommendation, realizing that it's really complex, as, as Paul was mentioning. You know, what if we do make, you know, a recommendation for an interim ban, there's, there's no other alternatives, potentially, to replace these chemicals so nothing may happen. Or, you know, whatever, in terms of, you know, c the Congress's view or industry's view. But I think we should ignore that and focus on what our charge is and what we're asked to do in right. terms of where our expertise is. It's not in understanding Congress or TSCA reform, et cetera, but it's hazard, exposure, yep. risk, make a recommendation. Because I think if we try to couch what our recommendations are and then think about how it's going to be used or the political system, you know, et cetera, we, we can't predict that and we probably shouldn't be doing that. As scientists, we should be focusing on the data at hand, so. Or the lack of data at hand. In, that, in this case, yes. Would you be comfortable with that approach in terms of how we make our recommendations? In That's always the best approach. It's just right now I, I'm, I'm struggling with um, a recommendation of banning, interim ban at this point. Because I'm so, it, it's terrible. There's so little information. But that's, that's not anything that is, is part of our, <laughs> uh, that we can respond to. I mean, we, we don't control that. Yeah, it's not part of our charge or expertise. Right. You know, it was like hypotheticals and, you know, it would almost be like, you know, we were invited as an expert panel to, re to review these chemicals mm -hmm. and this is all completely hypothetical, may sound ridiculous, but, you know, in terms of hazard, exposure, risk, and we were asked to do this in, you know, a, 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 a vacuum, a system, uh, you know, another country or another civilization where we have, we shouldn't have any regard for what's next in terms of how that data is used, but we're just asked to focus on the science, the, the data or the lack of data and the hazard exposure and risk. All right. Let me, I'll, I'll, I'm willing to compromise. I'm willing to go to the issue that we could propose this, but if the commission right, is say not. Say what you mean by this. This idea of proposing an interim ban, all right? I'm willing to do that as long as something's written in a proviso, as a proviso that if in fact the commission doesn't agree with the need or the desire to, to have this interim ban, they must, they must ensure that data is collected before the next time a CHAP is convened on these issues to ensure that the data is available to make an adequate risk assessment. I'm willing to go for a ban, but I need to have that other statement because I just don't want it to sit there. Yeah, but I, I mean, I, again, I think we can recommend that, but, but the word must, I mean, I don't think we have that Well, we're, 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 we're recommending an interim ban because there's no data. Right, I'm we, we can't say that they must uh, initiate an interim ban. We can just recommend that they do. And we can recommend as well that they do what you ask, but we can't. All right, the, can't words, to the wording, uh, we'll wordsmith it, but if you're willing to do it with those two concepts in mind, I'm willing to do it. I think that's perfectly reasonable, and we've done that same thing in our wording for some of the other phthalates, as I remember. But this and is We much, encourage this the relevant much. agencies to. Why don't we try to. But this is much, this has to be much to stronger. It put it on paper. Because on. there is a total lack of data. Yeah. Mike, can we go up to one of the phthalates where we recommend an interim ban, but we also asked 
made a statement to the effect that uh, we encourage the relevant agencies to George just a second can't remember the way it wording I think we also have to consider that we have to be consistent with with the approaches for some of the other standards we discussed yesterday, like the NOP and uh, the IDP. Because looking at uh, the data apart from the anti androgenic effect, we don't have much more data for these substances either. And we kind of said, well, they are out of this window of activity, so there's minimal reason for concern in this respect. Here, you're inside the window. The question, we don't, don't know, know at all, but we don't have much other data for the other delays, that was one. like the IDP the and IDP. the NLP. So we have to be consistent with the approach we, we go. But I think what Chris said before is important is that here there is exposure. In some of the other instances there weren't, so I don't see that it's equivalent. Here there is an exposure. But, but we, we have don't to, know. We have to assume the same exposure when we lift the ban for these substances. So in a couple of years' time, uh, it might be DIDP and DNOP again on the on the list in the pie chart. Yes, it was the one before that. I think Holger, what you're saying is in terms of the the hazard. The, the, so we're looking for one. It, the requirements or, or what we an interim ban discussed yesterday recommend yeah. interim ban and relevant and, and consistent there's a statement about with today. We, mm -hmm. we, we uh, encourage the relevant agencies to You're giving me a headache. <laughs> I would propose to have. I would propose to also have a look what we wrote for DNOP and DIDP. A what? Just for a consistency check. This is DNOP. Yeah, that's because of that skeletal issue. Yeah, that's one I was going to look into. Well, I think the immediate difference that leaps to the eye here is that uh, a couple of these substances indeed are not currently used in toys, and that's a big difference. That's the point I was making. But if you propose to lift the interim ban, they can be used again. So we have the same situation as for the substitutes we are talking about today. Mm. Yeah, and the recommendation for this one was, was tending very differently from the one we're contemplating here, which is to instantly. The last sentence is, however, there is no evidence for of anti androgenic effects observed with some other phthalates. Yeah, Holger, are you suggesting that we're better de to deal with chemicals we know something about than chemicals we don't know anything about? Is that what your point is? Yeah, I, I think I agree with Holger. We need to take care of this and make sure we are consistent. GDI. Consistent OP. in our approach. Yeah, try that one. I, I'm not sure which one it is. That we, it's the next one. It was one year at the beginning, yeah. There it is, yeah. Oh, I, it, I, this is DBP. But that had some wording that was... Well, D -E -P DBP was probably better. Does that 
statement there, CHAP recommends that U.S. agency responsible for dealing with, in this case, TXIB, modified that, would that, that be a statement that would begin to address your concerns? I would say that not only other agencies, but also CPSC. Including, well, I think that. In this case, it would be including CPSC. In this case, CP, it would be included. including CPSC. Sure. I would say modifying it with that. That would help. Well, if we could copy that. Because the reason why is because of the fact we don't know who is. In this particular, we wouldn't, wouldn't know whether it's the dust from toys, whatever. It's the highest exposure, so CPSC has to be part of the equation in this instance. I was thinking of the other statement. The one down below? The one above that one. Whoops. Whoops. We lost you. Which one are we talking about now? For the articles? We have to go back to the. Did you did you cut and you're going to paste it? Oh, oh, oh I, I have. You haven't pasted it yet. Oh, I did paste, but not there. not the one we were, not the right one. Oh wait. So the the chap recommends. Here, yeah, modify it appropriately. Exposures would be primarily concern, would be, um, I think I would probably just leave it at it. exposures. or even D TXIB. Or who have jurisdiction. Not just that, it has to, you have to conduct the research. I mean, that, that's what we're missing here, is research. Conduct the necessary research that would support risk assessment? The report hazard assessment, exposure assessment, and then ultimately the risk assessment. Okay. Because right now we're just living in the dark. Necessary uh, research or research report hazard assessment and exposure assessment necessary. Four risk assessments to support risk management decisions. Yeah. Or, That's awkward, but. Yeah, I know, but we can always modify that. I don't like the width of view. To support is fine. You don't need width of view. Or, That's, in essence, what I'd like to see. 
you know, you can. Or even obtain. Valid. I think we use the word obtain because not necessarily the government who would. Okay. Actually, fine. Can. All right. strong enough well this this presumably is going to follow that we recommend interim ban interim ban that would be our opening statement mm -hmm. after we complete the risk <clears throat> so <clears throat> we need to now put in the, the the factors that are of concern to us that lead to our recommendation. So let's start doing that. Well, first of all, there are exposures. Okay. In the real environment and that CPSC has found this comp this material in children's toys XIB however Magnitude and extent of exposures with respect to health outcomes is unknown. And then, Andreas, maybe you can put in a statement or Chris on what you want to see done in toxicology. Help us guide on the exposure. We make it stronger, not just that it's in the environment, but that it's a prevalent. Indoor environment, in the yeah. home environment, in the home. That's a good idea. And, it, and it's and was, you know, even I would rate it. I mean, sixty percent of homes. Are you kidding me? That's huge. But um, that's up but in there the are exposure. A lot of things, but there are a lot of things that are in sixty percent of the homes. It's just a matter. The problem we have is we don't know the intensity. I mean, that's that's the issue where I get a little bit concerned because prevalence doesn't mean a hazard. But the children are exposed. And then if it's children, in the, children if it's exposed in the to dust, everything. If it's in the dust, children are going to be high, have higher exposure than adults. Yeah, well, for everything. Could you say TXIV is a frequent contaminant in the home environment? Prevalent. Prevalent? Or, but it, we don't know the intensity of it. Okay, that's fine. But a prevalent contaminant in the home? Say that children could be at greater risk? We don't know. I don't know what the risk is. That's the we issue. We do know it's in the dust. You're, you're, you don't mean you mean exposure in at greater of, sorry, exposure. exposure. Yeah. yeah. We know that because kids spend time on the floor, much more of the time on the floor than adults, that their exposures would be higher. That's about all we can say. We can we can say that. Yeah. If you want to put that in. Yeah. Considering the fact. Considering fact that children spend much more time in close contact to dust deposited on the floor and playing with toys, right? Their exposures would be higher. Or, or likely higher. I mean, it doesn't. No, they would be higher. It doesn't mean that they're consequential, but they're higher. You know, kids have more exposure to dirt than adults. Why? Because they go in the backyard and they play in the dirt. But it doesn't mean that it's toxic. It's just 
a matter of the fact that the exposures are there. It's a matter of the quantity of the material and the duration and the all these other parameters which determine whether or not it may be toxic. So do you want to change would be to is higher? Yeah, is, is higher is fine. Now the connection to the lack of toxicology data is really crucial. How do you say that? Well, but and then but this Eastman 2001 study where they observe some sort of, aren't these anti-androgenic effects? We don't know. They could be. But the, the epididymal and That's testicular not. sperm counts, yeah. Don't know. Hmm. I just think a strong statement on the need for research on identifying whether or not there's an anti-angiogenic hazard is essential to, to clarify whether or not these exposures are anything meaningful or inconsequential. Yeah. I think we, should, we could add that right I think that's the, the key higher. question here. And, and risks. Up by higher, yeah. Additional research. It's also required simultaneously required Your exposures to TXIB are associated with associated with anti-androgenic For effects, effects. I don't think you want to just limit it to anti-androgenic, right? Anti-androgenic and other health effects. To to it's necessary to determine or to assure safe use of the chemical. Have it really broad. It's I agree. It can't just focus on anti-androgenicity. Okay. I agree. We go back to the famous um, unintended consequences of MTBE. Oh, are associated with adverse That's the issue. Adverse health effects. Or, or put, make that an or or a replace. Associated with anti-androgenic or, or other, other. other health effects. Okay. But before you say it, the sentence of additional research is required, wouldn't you want to make a statement about the lack of data? Because the, the first two, three lines, or two lines are about exposure, and then you need to basically say, we Chap know what, is, what Chris is, is, is concerned about the lack of factual, that there's a lack of. But, I mean, but. Publish. That's a concern to us, right? In our making this decision, we're right. But we haven't we haven't used concern yeah. terminology in the others just to keep it. Okay. I, I agree with with Russ. We're not going to use concern. We're not going to use concern. Oh, no. Notes, chap notes, chap chap recognizes notes. notes. Yeah. Chap yeah. notes. It, not escape notes, your notice. Notes a lack of. Publicly available. Yeah. Hazard information. Yeah, hazard information. Or TXIV. Therefore. Very good. 
add something, though, under the recommendations? Just, mm. and I know we're supposed to be talking about risk and hazard and exposure, and I agree with what Russ is saying, but could we add something under recommendations that the consideration of, you know, some sort of a communication with the company, even at, there may be an advantage to not having everything in the public um, in order to get the information that's needed? Because in this case, there have been studies done, but we were unable to assess their quality without further I, detail. I don't like that. The, the point I'm trying to get to is I think it, I, I would like to say something about the process. The process isn't working. We're um, going to say that so, in another section, a totally different section. But we could repeat it time and time again under the recommendations here as well. Not just a recommendation for this chemical, I understand that, but that's that I think is is one of the biggest statements we can make, and maybe that needs to be in the executive summary or someplace I, I like think, that. I but think that's where it's most. Effective. I think it's more effective yeah. there, Chris, because there, you know, the people who only read three pages will read that. They're not going to read every other part of the document. Is everyone happy with the risk statement as it's written? Yeah, I just had a few clarifications. Sure. So, hazard we say unknown. Minimal data do not demonstrate hazard. Is that correct? Because, you know, we're, we're basically saying that there's lack of data, published data. We're, we're only um, viewing the summary, basically. Mm. Do we want to say that the minimal data do not demonstrate a hazard? Or do we want to? I, I, I don't. Then because then that why can we be misconstrued, I think. Uh, yeah, why are we recommending a minimum ban? Because the, you know, the, the question we have at least about the, the, the reproductive tox data. Is right, but that might, hazard might, line there was written months ago before, our discussions today. So I just want to make sure that. We don't, miss that. You know, in terms of the minimal data, do not demonstrate a hazard. And You're then talking about Part B. Part B. Yeah, is yeah. That, I, I is would that not. Correct I would based not, on our discussion. I would not think so. Okay, so I would revise that. And then the other comment I had for my CPSC, where you, we say it's prevalent in the home environment, and CPSC has found this in toys. Mm -hmm. Can you put a qualifier on that? Has has found this widely in toys? Has found this? It, I don't think we can or, do or that. Or that's not known. I'm just asking, Mike. No, I think it, it's 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 not a hard number, but I I wouldn't go that way. Went that way with the prevalent in the home environment. So if the data suggested that you tested you well, know, we whatever did, forty we did, toys, we, we it had was a thirty nine. I would say it's some toys, or and you know, fifteen percent of them had of the PVC toys. Well, a hundred and some toys and, you know, maybe 30-something were PVC and 15 percent of those had TXIB. So it's, it's, it's a, a soft number. Want to work on Part B? Part B. Isn't that your point, Russ? That it's yeah. difficult to evaluate with minimal data what the hazard is, but they're. they're it I just know, doesn't do seem consistent with our discussion in the last half hour, and then to say it's unknown, but minimal data do not demonstrate a hazard, and then we're going on to saying something much stronger in the risk and recommendation statement. And even pointing out that the that the gestation window isn't appropriate for um, measuring anti-antigenic effects in the study that's reported. Limited data we have. I, I would modify that just to say minimal data available. Point. Yeah. That's a. That's fine. Leave it at that. But the, the point, I think, to, to, to emphasize here is that the, these data do not enable us to to make any conclusions about hazards. Uh, they're indeterminate. It's indeterminate. Right. 
why I was concerned where we say do not demonstrate a hazard. It's well, I mean, we could modify it to say minimal data available uh, that do not allow a hazard determination. We could modify it that way as well. do not allow I'm okay. Ready? I think we're okay. You know, if, if we had them. thought about this a year ago, <laughs> when we had more time, it, it seems to me that an opportunity for the chat that perhaps we've missed is to be able to say there are some chemicals with data, there are chemicals without data, and actually try to funnel towards chemicals that we know something about that are, you know, less hazardous than others instead of, I don't know. What do you mean by funnel? Well, so, I mean, we, you know, we have ranked the, the phthalates that we've seen in terms of some of them are much worse than others. If we're going to use chemicals, you just use the ones that we know something about that are less hazardous. Instead of ones that we don't know anything about, which is what we tend to do. You're, you're asking for logic. And unfortunately, it doesn't always exist when we're dealing with these things. We've, we've seen instances where there have been unintended consequences as we use of other chemicals, and it's, you know, cost a lot of money for all sides. But these chemicals that we're looking at now may very well be very good chemicals, that's, very safe chemicals. But that's my point. But that's, we don't know it, and that, so there's no... But that's my point also, Chris, because that's why I'm so reluctant about banning something that I don't know anything about, but the fact in the absence of data, do I allow a kid to stick this thing in his mouth? There is the public health conundrum with the, the desire not to ban all chemicals. Okay, I'm going to move that we take a, a 15 minute break and come back. Okay, so we'll be back at uh, 1020. Okay. Try to get a sense of uh, uh, from the manufacturer uh, what other kinds of tox data that might be available and how much, and, and it's something I'll. I'll get back to with the chap in a in a week or so. Um, I don't know if it's you know because of where we are in the process. Um, I th um, we'd have to see how much information there is and so on. But we'll uh, we'll get back to the chap on that. And will that be true for the other five substitutes? As well, well, as as far as I know, this this only applies to the. TXIB or the, okay. the isobutyrate. So given what we what we have yeah. here, what what modifications uh, chap like to make? If any. Olger, do you want to um, Modify the recommendation. I think in a way we have to be a bit more precise about the recommendations. 
um, the wording I would propose would maybe like something like uh, You want to begin with that? Or so up at the beginning? Yeah. Okay. I, I would start, be, say we begin with it, yeah. I would say something like chap. Oh. No, I would, would take out the recommend. The chap does not own the use of XIP in children's voice and child care articles. For the reasons stated. Because of the reasons stated above. Don't even have to we don't it. have to repeat it. That leads, I think, if, if you started the next sentence with a, a moreover, that would tie that into the next mm -hmm. sentence. I want to say something in the hazard section about the fact that since this is not a phthalate that health or the hazard evaluation should be broader than just anti-androgenicity. Or do we do we say these criteria in somewhere else? It says your or other adverse effects. Up in the, I was thinking in the hazard part. But. We could put up in hazard that that chap notes that TXIB is not um, a phthalate, pardon me, yeah, right. and therefore um, its, to its toxicity I say that. Because if it's toxicity assessment is unclear. Something yes, like that. I, that's very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, can I suggest that under those recommendations, I, I think, well, at the moment this is, uh, this is rough uh, and I'm, I really think we need to polish it more, but we can't do this now that we just uh, indicate uh, in, in rough English what we're going to say. It has to be polished later. Um, uh, the, the choice of words with condone, etc., is probably not ideal. Sounds a bit like a magisterial or something. I agree. I mean, I think it captures the essence of what we want to say, but um, you can use something like does not support the use. I mean, something different, but I don't know what. what? Does not support the no, use. I, th I think it should say, uh, I propose. Or condone. No, I looked it up on the thesaurus, but it's not. I, I propose that this recommendation expresses very clearly the situation that here. Um, where we where chap sees the problem, the situation is that there's a widely used chemical, intimate use, but untested, and that's the problem. Yeah. 
So can you, where, I mean, you, right between moreover, above and for moreover, the, yes. the statements you made. Yes. What exactly what you were saying? Um, uh, this, uh, this is a uh, an abandoned chemical, intimate use pattern, high exposure potentially, but no toxicity data. And no toxicity data is wrong, but insufficient. Adequate, yeah. Available or just end it? You could fuse that sentence if you uh, said the CHAP does not, whatever, the use of TXIV in children's toys and child care articles because TXIV is an abundant chemical with intimate use patterns and potentially high exposure, but inadequate toxicity data are available. But then we should go on with therefore the chap strongly recommends. Yeah, therefore, that. Mm -hmm. I would even put in a strongly. I have no difficulty with that. Strongly recommends, Mike. Okay. So then the in, uh, recommendation for interim ban, et cetera, is then not made. Right. And I think that's a reasonable way to go. In this, get rid of this. Or leave it, leave it in and say not applicable. I think in some cases we just deleted it. Do you want to add another sentence to the recommendation, Andreas? Say not, not thus at this stage, but, but it, it will need polishing, but that's edi editing and we shouldn't waste our time with that now. Yeah. you can just copy that whole section. Well, uh, to, to a degree. I think, Mike, DEHA was a chemical you did not find in the... the well, we, we didn't see it. I think we saw it in the past. That's why it was on the list. We didn't see it this time. Um, one of the things we did notice in the food studies is that there is uh, exposure from food. I mean, the micrograms per day are, are higher than the phthalates. Uh, I don't know what that means, but, you know, there is exposure from food because I think it is approved for use in food packaging. So um, the focus of these reports has been based on reproductive and developmental. Can Summaries in the adverse effects section about other endpoints available? I, 
I, well, let's see. I know we, that we, the staff did do um, tax review. We have tax review reviews available for all of these that cover the spectrum of effects. But I think what the CHAP has written so far covers reproduction and development. That's largely because we've been focusing on phthalates. So for the, right. for the case of substitute chemicals that are not phthalates, would it be reasonable to have a more general box evaluation in these sections? Mm. I, mean, I don't want to ask for, you know, a mountain, but. So do we want to talk about more general guidelines, criteria for these substitute chemicals that aren't phthalates, instead of spending our time now on evaluating single chemicals? Yes. Especially if we're going to, if we agree, and I'm not sure if we all agree, but if we agree to, to ask for additional information on the TOC studies, then our review would, should consider those. Mm-hmm. I think we need, I think that it's a better use of our time right now. And things can be put together and make some decisions later. The logic is, and you guys know more about this holder than I do, but when it's a phthalate, we have certain focus because it's a phthalate and we know something about phthalates. If it's not a phthalate, just focus on the antiandrogenic effects is not uh, is not adequate. So that would relevant. be our criteria. Now, do we do we need to go back to other chemicals that aren't phthalates in what we've already done, besides these substitutions? Or other chemicals yeah, that aren't. But, but now that we've we've come to an agreement, uh, well, we here's a consensus in the panel that we're very uncomfortable with these data gaps and having to make recommendations in these situations when essentially the risks are indeterminate. So uh, since we're not tying this now with any recommendation in, in terms of interim ban or whatever, um, why, why, what precisely are we needing criteria for now? We can note these concerns yeah. every time that's appropriate and that's it. Now, think about it, look, it makes sense. So you're saying the recommendation throughout would just be, we don't have any data, we can't make a recommendation. Well, let's just see what we, we get. And we're requesting more data. Well, I think, well, this is, yeah. Yeah, we have data. Just as an example, DEHA is probably one of the more data-rich ones, and there are data. This is just part of a table on repeat dose studies. So. <laughs> Some of these do have data. Um, looks like uh, I know this DEHA, there's been a two year study, so they're, they're older studies, but they have most of them, but they have been done. So, published studies. Uh, many of these are. Looks like many of these are. So, um, and we have the reviews are done. We could. Uh, in a short time, summarize the non 
uh, reproductive developmental data in the same format that we have. Okay. I mean, that could be done in, you know, not, probably not by noon, but, but in a, early next week. And we do have some data on the leachability of these non uh, phthalate substitutes from toys. Some of the studies have been done by CPSC, so at least we have something to work with. Again, it's not totally sufficient, but at least it's something to start the discussion. Yeah, and here's, here's one where the DEHA, there is at least one developmental talk study of sufficient rigor um, that at least at the doses that they used, the highest dose, there was no anti-androgenic effect noted, and it was done at the appropriate gestational stages. Now, th this is a summary of what we have, TXIB. So, I mean, there is information, but, I, you know, we don't have the underlying studies. They've got repeat dose studies. Uh, up to 90 days, I at least reproductive and developmental studies. See some of the endpoints where they're noted. <coughs> All right, well, if you can get these summarized for us, then we can work on it. But Andreas, I think, we'll, we'll, let's go back to his, his point. You know, do we need criteria? Do we feel that it's comfortable going the way we're going with these other chemicals um, as we did in the past, or do we need to do something else? Well, I think I think we were in agreement that, as with TXIB, we we're going to look at you know, production, uh, whether they were in toys and personal care items, um, criteria we developed there, and and others if necessary, and we can certainly uh, put those together for the other phthalate substitutes and and uh, send them around to the chap and. Uh, we can develop, I think, recommendations. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think I, the criteria would be the same. Yeah. Apart from the fact that these are not phthalates, so we would need to not just focus on anti-androgenic effects. Right. But like, I think the criteria in terms of exposure and risk and or exposure, hazard, risk, et cetera, would carry forward. I'm okay. Okay. So, so, and and I guess also if if there's information about exposure in terms of children, if there's migration information, if there's right. you know, all of that sort yep. of stuff. We have that for several of them, and that's going to be in in Paul's section of the report too. Yeah. It's already done. That's done. Yep. It's already done. Mm -hmm. The question is, is that. The question I had before is that it's really insufficient, and that's why I was troubled on it before I even walked in the room this morning. So, at least now we will have some data and we'll be able to at least, I think, make some reasonable judgments on the level of science we have available to us.
no what questions. Are the next steps and the timeline and well, the the, the timeline. So then, you're taking something it, out of your pocket. Yeah, so and I you. will I will send this around by email. But um, all the writing assignments that we agreed to, um, and for example, I will I will redo the DNLP and the DIDP. Uh, we will complete the recommendations for the, the phthalate substitutes. We will. Uh, Mike has done the, the recommendations for all the phthalates. Uh, all these things will be uh, communicated to the CHAP, um, will, will be due by the 17th of March. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the recommendations for the other alternatives, how are we going to, we're going to do that by phone call or um, by email? I think by email, yeah. So I'll send those around as soon as I can get those together um, and then Hopefully we'll have a final. I think copy. it might be helpful to have a a, a a phone call though. Phone call between now and if it's possible to schedule it, just because I think there is value in having a discussion. You want that done after we develop um, uh, something to look at? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll do that. That would be that would be the only way. Otherwise, yep. it would be not the most productive use of your. Yep. Okay. So it might be that we get the data and we can do it on our own with emails and we decide to cancel, but I think it'd be good to put it. So would that be like in early March phone call? Yep. And the problem is you're bumping into SOT at that point. Yeah. And Phil, early. just to confirm what we said yesterday, the structure of each of these is That's going to be market. different. You're not going to have a bullet for every tox study and every human study. It's going to be a summary. Yes. And I'm okay. going to and I'll do the human. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and that's another point. Um, uh, Holger, you were going to provide me with summaries of exposure, mm -hmm. okay? And I don't know, Paul, you were going to provide me with what? For the, the, the phthalate recommendations, where there's information about exposure that was relevant to your information? Yeah, I thought we discussed it yesterday. I'll make sure that it's complete in each one of the uh, recommendations. Yeah, yeah okay. you're going to send me anything you yeah. want. Now, there are two things that I did provide to Mike. One was the connecting paragraph for that, that table with the non-table of the intercomparison table, and we'll just have to review it. And then there was a table, then was the, the, the three or four paragraphs I sent now, this morning, and I sent you an update on this entire issue of data, sources, gaps, and what's needed to go to make this a better process of that. And before, uh, before we conclude, um, Sherry Falvey, our general counsel, wants to come down and, and talk a little bit to the chap. So, I got ten minutes. So, I think we can do that now. Okay. Okay, she's on her way down. Okay. Because we have to catch it. Yeah. Eleven thirty. Let me unplug so that I don't interrupt her. When is SOT? Second week of March. conference call before that. Well, we're going to have the, it's going to be based, the conference call is going to be about the, the phthalate substitute recommendations, correct? Oh, okay. And those we can have ready mm -hmm. by the end of the month. Yeah. So we'll send those around in that. I mean, do you, do you want to set a date for that? Week of the 5th? Would that work? Uh, I have a medical issue that I have to deal with that week. So I'm not sure. 
So week, the week of March 5th, well, Anybody have times they can't meet or How about March 2nd then Paul before Friday March 2nd I'm in I'm away that day I'm in meet me too York. How about um, March 1st you see you on holiday as well March 1st yeah Well, let's let's just um, uh, Michael send out a, an email and we'll get your calendars and, and set up a, a time that way what about Friday the 16th Mar March I can do March, March 16th, 16th. Yeah. yes so that'd be just after SRT okay I can do the 16th can't do the 16th, can't do the 16th. about the next week now we're getting too late then. We may be able to do it at the end of the week of the eighth. The fifth, uh, the first week before SOT, but I'm not sure yet. I have to finalize a couple things. How does the the week of the fifth look for other people? I I could do the sixth or seventh. Chris, is that Thursday? Six is okay. Tuesday, Wednesday. <clears throat> the six works with me. I, um, I've got class at one o'clock. Tuesday the sixth. I can't. Come um, <clears throat> I'd be. I'd only have like an eleven to twelve o'clock window on the sixth. The seventh, I'd have more time in the morning. Just because I have a student committee meeting and then a seminar. On the sixth, so I'd have eleven to twelve on the sixth, and then pretty much any time till about two on the seventh. But Paul, you're you're out for that. I'm not sure yet. <clears throat> Paul, you were saying maybe the 8th or 9th in the morning. The end of the week may be better for Paul. No, not for Hogar. No. Okay. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll, we'll do this by email, Mike. Okay. Probably better. Um, when, whenever you're ready. <clears throat> we talked on the phone. I'm here. I sent you a memo about of the chat. Um, the role of the commission in policy and the chap on science. And, um, I haven't been listening to this morning's session, but um, those in my office who have thought it might be helpful for me to come down and talk to you about I know it's challenging when the science is not um, complete and you want more science you always want more science but we need scientific recommendations and that's why I took the time to write out um, that with regard to the substitutes with regard to these other phthalates um, it's really the commission's decision whether to to ban them. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't <clears throat> really have interim ban authority. Congress can do that, but uh, we have a, a regulatory structure that's pretty straightforward and is driven by science. And the commission's looking for that science from you. Now, if the science isn't there and there's need for additional study, there's no reason you couldn't recommend with regard to a particular phthalates or phthalate in particular 
we really just can't give you a recommendation on that. We recommend that you continue to study it vigorously and, and, and in a timely manner. But you can't really just, um, I mean, you can say whatever you feel from a policy basis. Um, I'm not going to tell you you can't express your views. Of course you can. But what we're really looking for is science. And so I just want to, you know, if you have any specific questions, I know two people have to leave. We can also continue this dialogue. You could send written questions. I can respond written in a written manner. Or um, we could, I can participate on your next conference call. I think call. we're okay. Anything you'd like. But, but while you're here now, we just mm -hmm. drafted a few lines. I mean, is it worth Mike just showing her what we wrote if that's sure. That'd be in the, the realm in charge of? Because we, we wrote it, you're here, might as well. Okay. Show you if others agree. I don't usually like give legal but, advice but on the base, fly in public. But just, <laughs> just okay. to base, see it. Based upon what you've said, I think that's where we are. You good. can, you okay, can take good. more time if you don't want a response. So. Okay. But based upon what you just said, I think we're in the same place. Good. Okay. We, we, we struggled, but we're in the same place. Recommendation is And it's short, five. so. Short and to the point. <laughs> yeah, <coughs> cut it off. Uh -huh. Available. <laughs> right, that's exactly where I am. Fine. Okay. Okay. Um, I also know there was some discussion about confidential data. It's really hard for us to do a rulemaking with not without being completely open about science and I know you're relying on someone I think Shauna Swan is that right um, some data that maybe is going to be made public eventually as part of this um, and so you know <clears throat> we would be if we were relying on that and didn't make that public we'd be criticized and you know anything we rely on we need to give the people who want to comment to us on the science the ability to see what you relied on and respond to that. And so that's my concern about that, and I just wanted to make sure you all understood that. Um, we can continue to wrestle with that issue. But, but, but isn't that basically because of the Shelby Act? The Shelby Act basically said anything used for regulations has to be able to be reviewed by all parties. A, a variety of different legal yeah, resources. I mean, but that's right. the most recent, I think, mm -hmm regulation or congressional uh, law that came out? Well, we're, we're aware of that, and we, we, we've, made, we've made an effort of uh, basing our recommendations on data published in the peer-reviewed literature, and I don't think uh, Shana Swan's name was not mentioned at all in that connection. Yeah, that's published. Um, okay. You know, maybe the individual values for each child or pregnant woman are not, but the the data is published in more of a summary measure. Yeah. And I think everything else, too, that we've considered. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Thank yeah. you. Bye. Thanks, Russ. So are we adjourned? We are adjourned. Okay. We're adjourned. Thank you.